Greetings, dear friends. It's our joy to come together today around the world. And I hope that you are ready and that things are operating for you perfectly because uh, I realize that many of you living in other countries have a difficulty getting hooked up to this kind of a program. But we're going to stick with it until the Lord uh, gets, gets it straightened out for us. And so, so thankful that you're in our audience today. May the Lord bless you. Our hearts are reaching out to other parts of the world. I don't know if any of you getting this program will get it in the Middle East or where they're having lots of trouble. I just want you to know that it, we are praying for those dear hearts that are going through such an awful time. <coughs> <coughs> I was just uh, four, 14 years old when Hitler started his march of taking over countries, just like the terrorists so-called are doing now. And I, n I never will forget that. The end of his program killed over six million Jews. And there's no telling how many this new program led by the devil in the name of Islam will have killed before it's over. But the worst thing in that goes on. To those of you who are acquainted with us here in America, we don't feel safe anymore. We never know when the next thing will happen even here. And so let us pray one for another. Let Christians everywhere have an interest in what's going on in the world and trust our Savior to help us. I need to tell you, people are always saying, is this the tribulation period? It is, it is a troubling period, but it's not the tribulation period. There are certain events to take place where you will absolutely know it's tribulation period, but don't worry about it. You won't be here. You won't hear an announcement about it. You won't see anything on news about it. You'll be gone. So just pray. Look, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. That's the best thing we could do. And I want to encourage you that if ever we got the gospel out, now's the time to do it. You see, God prepares for everything. And as sure as I'm talking to you now, God prepared for this world to come to the knowledge that Christ is the life of a Christian, of a believer. And it is these very believers, of course, that are being killed and murdered and going through the awfulest things you ever heard of. They can't stand the name Christian. Really, it isn't Christians they can't stand, it's Christ. There's such a hatred among Muslims for Jesus Christ that that's really the fire that lights up these people. So let us pray for one for another. Let us be interested in praying one for another and standing together because we may all be going through difficult times. There are some of our politicians here in America right now who are warning us. There are others that have gone to bed or to a spa or to overseas or to the golf course. But there are some that are speaking up, and I pray for you to pray for them, that they will have the courage to stand up and speak of the things that are most important. Today, our mechanism in this program to you that are overseas is under the direction of one of our believers here who we call Curtis. Pray for him. He has never run this program before because it is a very difficult program, but the man who runs it, Timothy, my son-in-law, is out, out today taking care of family business. But it is so good to be with you anyhow. May God make this a important day, the most important day you've ever had. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn with me to John, the, I believe it's John that I want, the 12th chapter and the 24th verse. 
When I started preaching as a kid preacher, I was only 18 when I started holding revivals. And from the time I was 18 to the time I left being an evangelist, I never missed making a revival somewhere or somehow. I preached everywhere. But one thing that steadied me, uh, uh, made me steady and kept me going was this verse in John 12 and 24. The verse reads, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Believe it or not, through the years I preached, I know, a dozen, dozen different service, sermons on that same verse. And I tried to make every one of them different because I kept finding something in that verse that I needed to tell the people. But here late, since I come to know Christ as my life, that verse has become the most stronghold verse that I have found for the Christ life. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. This scripture says, a corn of wheat. So let's change the wording on that. Change the words to Jesus Christ. Except Jesus Christ falls into the ground or into his death. Except Jesus Christ falls into his death and dies, completely dies, as it is stated in the scriptures, he must. Until he dies, falls on the ground and completely dies, he has been alone. I preached on that phase of this verse many times because I always thought he was getting converts. I always thought he was turning the world upside down with signs, wonders, and miracles. But he couldn't. He couldn't. It wasn't his time. And his time will not come to set the world free of sickness and disease. All the things we preached back when we took over the Messianic message. that The healing, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, opening blind uh, eyes and ears. We thought that was the Jesus. That was Jesus manifesting himself in an outer form to a group that God had made many promises to, and Jesus had basically come to fulfill those promises as far as Israel and the Jew was concerned. But thank God his coming was twofold. Someday he has to die. Someday he has to fall into the ground and be dead. Two reasons for this. First reason is that he will be the final seed that I minister today. The other thing is, God had poured into his body the sins of humanity. All of the sin. All of the sin. The verse that is most exact on that is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world didn't say he loved the Jew, didn't say he loved the Gentile. He loved the world, everybody. And whosoever believeth in him had no reason to perish because Christ will pay the price in his death. That means that God was ready to pour the sin of humanity into the one body, the one seed that would take care of it. Jesus, Jesus would take care of every man's sin. And the way I've always seen that was that Christ went to the cross with sin in his body. He that knew no sin became sin. The sin of the universe, the sin of every person God had created was placed in his body. It was placed there with an understanding, I think, from God 
that now then, he'll never die again, he'll never hurt again, he'll never be in a bad shape again with humanity because I'm going to save every human being I have created by this death. Now that doesn't mean they were saved and it sure doesn't mean they are saved right now. But it meant that the price would be paid. The death would be wrought. The most important aspect of God's plan would come into function at that time. There would be fulfilled at the cross the two greatest things that has ever happened in the book. They are the two greatest acts of God before the world was created. Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ. That would take place after his death. And the other was from Peter 1 and uh, 20 to 30. It says, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So you can see how smart God is. He paid the price. He did what must be done for humanity before you and I come along. And the sad thing that has happened in our day is people are preaching, come to the Christ, be saved, and you'll have a better life. But you see, that's kind of a shaded story because you cannot preach a better life for humanity aside from the cross. So where mankind was really saved was at the cross. Everyone was saved. And you know, I don't think sinners are being told that. I think they've watched Christians so long and they've watched church entity so long that they're kind of fed up and don't understand it all. But I think this gospel must be preached that before time started, God had fixed it so that at one certain point, whosoever believeth would not perish but have everlasting life because the death of the Savior and the fact that he would place us all in Christ was forthcoming. More to that later, perhaps. A lamb was slain. That's what Jesus did at the cross. He was God's sacrifice. God only offers one sacrifice for humanity. You get that? I think some people get saved thinking, Lord, I sure do thank you for coming down today and saving me. That's not the gospel. The gospel is that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Believe it or not, in the Christ life, we embrace that part of the message. I was talking to somebody here the other day, and he was saying, well, I sure hope the Lord comes and straightens us out. And it looks like only God can straighten out the mess the world is in right now. But I looked up at him and I said, I'm sure glad God got one thing straightened out, that anybody that wants to be saved already has the price paid for their salvation. That's what God had in mind before he created the world. That's what God had in mind when Jesus died on the cross because the lamb was slain by the sacrifice on the cross. The world doesn't know that, I don't think. I think the world is still running around like chickens with a head cu cut off. Maybe you don't know a chicken like that, but you can, you can take the head off of a chicken and he'll still run around. So the best thing we did was grab them by the feet and hold them up and drain all the blood out, and we had a dead chicken. I want you to know that Christ has already been slain, that nobody, nobody can make him pay the price again. Nobody can crucify him again. He will never be crucified again. So God has it all worked out. And the end of that verse, it says, but if Christ dies, he will bring forth much fr fruit. Now, I'm taking away the it for the person of Christ. 
because that's what really was in Christ's mind when he said this. So many things take place in the scriptures that back up such statements as Christ makes. I'm going to give you a few scriptures on that and let you think it and mull it over. One thing, I have seen the glory of God in the last 40 years. Robbie and I have been preaching this message around the world. I have seen people who already had known these things, had read them in the scriptures, but never tied them together as their salvation. A salvation, but not their salvation. And I've had the great joy of taking the fruit of Christ and ministering to people who were already saved in God's plan, but simply needed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Among these people are a couple who have just gone to meet the Lord from this body. One of them is Brother Offenbecker. Brother Offenbecker is one you probably don't know because he married a Japanese wife. They both were faithful to this message to an nth degree, but he was very sickly. He finally, after over 20 years of being in this fellowship, went to meet the Lord a few days ago. What a person he was. He was a backer and a supporter of what it is we believe and practice and gave his life for it. Absolutely gave his life for it. Another was a fellow named Millet. Many of you know George Millet. George was a thrilling part of this fellowship he led the group in Portland. He never missed a meeting outside of Portland, one of our annual meetings or one of our meetings that covered whole areas. He never missed one. He was always there and faithful. God called him home, and I must tell you, I will miss them when I speak because I have things to say to them now that I couldn't say. Ten years ago, I didn't know. But I could say it now, because it is God's time for us to be awakened and stirred up as never before. So I want you to look into some scripture with me that may be a very important point to what I have to say today. Take your Bible, if you will. Well, take your Bible, if you will, and go with me to, what verse is it? Here it is. Go with me to Just a minute, and I'll be with it. I want to straighten out some verses here so that I have them labeled properly. Go with me to Galatians, the sixth chapter. Galatians, chapter 6. Look with me to, well, I'm going to change my mind again. I want you to go to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. It says this, Now to Abraham and his seed. Now, you may have trouble understanding this verse. So if you circle the word his, his seed, you'd be much better off. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds. He saith not, and to seeds of many, but he's really talking about one seed, but as of one. Circle that. 
and to the seed which is Christ. Abraham was the one who looked to God to fulfill all his promises. He didn't get to see those fulfilled, but the Spirit did move upon him and brought to him one important factor. The seed is Christ. Underline that. And to the seed which is Christ. One seed. One seed, just one seed needed to die at a cross, just one. And that one seed is Jesus Christ. Who is it that was planned before the foundation of the world was laid to give a seed? It was Jesus Christ. That was his purpose in the whole plan of God, to give the seed. The time was getting closer when this would take place, and Abraham had to make a statement about it. There are still people in Christianity that make Abraham the father of the believers. Their error is that the scriptures never say that. But the scripture do, does say that he is the father of faith. That's what he is. He was the father of faith. He was not the father of mankind. But he spoke of the one seed. When Jesus hung on the cross, it was the death of the one seed. Why? Why one seed? Parallel with that in this 16th verse was that Abraham had many seeds. So get this in your mind. God had revealed to Abraham, though he had many seeds, that not a one of them compared to the one seed. Just one. One seed, Jesus. When Jesus stood there on Palm Sunday and said these words, except the corn of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. What had he said? He had said two things. He had said, first, I have brought forth no fruit. No fruit. So Jesus preaching as a Messiah, as Jesus of Nazareth on this earth, brought forth no fruit. What was lacking? Christ had not yet died. The second thing was, when he dies, he will bring forth much fruit. He'll save the world or give them the opportunity to be saved. But they won't be saved until he dies. Why? Because God had taken the very simple idea and said that a corn of wheat that falls into the ground must die. It must have all of the elements to fall upon it. It husks. Its husk must be broken to release the life that is within it. Jesus knew that. Though he healed many sick, cast out many devils, and though he became the preaching point for the majority of people who pray for the sick and heal them and so forth, he said, it cannot take place until I die. He said these words before a huge crowd. This was Palm Sunday, a week before he would rise from the dead. On this Palm Sunday, 
He had a multitude of people following him as he came into the city. He was applauded. He was praised because they had all learned that he had raised Lazarus from the dead and they were ready to follow him. The Messianic people who were set aside by God to rule and reign on this earth were ready to take up their challenge by the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But that cannot be the essence of the message. And so Jesus said it plainly, until I, the seed, dies, there can be no proper fruit. I haven't made a complete analysis of it, but it had always bothered me. I had always been bothered by the fact that the multitudes Jesus preached to and the crowds that he healed and set free and cleansed of leprosy and whatever never showed up when he died. Why? They are not a part of his death. His death is something far greater and beyond that. Why? He's the seed that will fall into the ground and die. And when he dies, he will bring forth, according to his own words, in John 12 and 24, he will bring forth much fruit. Think of it. In John's third chapter, once again, we have something else that takes place. We have Nicodemus, the leader of the Jews, spiritual leader probably, had come to Jesus at night, I believe. And when he came to Jesus, he said, you must be sent from God because of the miracles you perform." It always bothered me in this verse that when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he employed none of our get saved truths. He wasn't a soul winner. He knew something Nicodemus didn't know. And so what did he say? He said something out of his time, out of his structure in God's plan, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see or enter the things of God. Oh, Nicodemus said that, I mean, you go back into the mother's womb, and Jesus never answered him. Why didn't he answer him? He had not died. He had not died. The seed that was to be planted by God to save the world had not yet died. So that must take place before anything else can happen. Nicodemus left Jesus unsaved. He left the Savior of the world who could not look him in the eye and say, you can be born again right now. Just believe. Why? There was no seed. The seed was up and talking. The seed had come in the middle of the night to deal with a Jewish leader. So there was no seed. He could give him no future. Did you know that before Jesus died, those people called Israel called Jews had no future. They could believe that Christ was coming, but they had no future until that took place and the seed was planted. So what does this bring to us? This brings to us not only that he bore our sins in his body, not only that when he died, he provided salvation for all people. 
but it shows that there will be nothing taking place in God's plan until the seed dies. What's in the seed? What's in the seed? The seed will produce a brand new existence for whosoever believes. The seed will produce an end without an end. People will leave this earth, but they will only be beginning the new life that is in them. A whole new world would be developed at the cross. A whole new gospel would come out of the cross. A whole new leader, not Jesus of Nazareth, which the Jews still count on. Israel still counts on Jesus of Nazareth coming back and setting them free. And that is one reason why when I see all the persecutions the Jews are going through, that's simply a persecution the Jews go through because they denied Jesus, his rightful place in the kingdom. He is to raise up the kingdom. He will be the king and the kingdom. Believers of Jesus Christ, you and I, never should speak of him being a king because that belongs to the Jew. He will be their king one day. But long after we're gone, in the millennium. But what is happening? On the cross, the seed is being provided for. Peter comes along, who is a Jew, but has accepted at least parts of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he must have been led by the Spirit in saying these words. Because his word in First Peter one in 23 was being born again by the incorruptible seed, not a corruptible seed. What has he done? Peter has preached something that has never been preached before. So I give him credit there, the Holy Spirit working with him. But sadly about Peter, we can take very little of what he says because he denied Christ his place in his life and continued with the law of gospel, circumcision. But he was brought up by God to speak to Nicodemus. Now does it make sense to you that the one person who led the people to whom God had made innumerable covenants, things he would do, promises he would make, he couldn't keep a one of them. He wouldn't keep a one of them. Why? Until he died, he couldn't keep those things. But in his death with the Jews and the Israelites, he can keep his promise. He will come back and sit on the throne. They wanted him to sit on then. But God didn't have a family. God didn't have a family. You don't just join a church and come into the family of God. The only way you get into God's family is by the seed. Mark it now. Be very careful with it. It is only the God seed in you that makes you a part of the family of God. Go to 1 John 3 and 9. 1 John 3 and 9. It says, whosoever is born of God, circle the word born, that's strategic. Whosoever is born by God, of God, does not commit sin. 
What's this verse talking all about when every one of us that read it know that we have committed sin since we've been saved? Did things wrong, had to repent, had to make right what we knew to be right. Just not commit sin. Why is it that the Christian exists that does not commit sin? For the seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. He is born of God. What? What an idea. So now we must be open to something that Jesus was open to when he made all his words on Palm Sunday. When he said that until I die, I cannot bring forth any fruit. He was saying that my seed will not be given to anybody until it comes out of death. The seed of God that was in Christ Jesus, that was to be given to every born-again believer, could not be given until the giver was dead. He must die before he could ever put his seed in us. You see, we have not been taught as Christians that God put a seed in us. What we've been taught, really, is churchanity. What the church does, what the church believes. But we haven't been taught what is in the family of God. What it takes to be in the family? Well, it's simply this. On the cross, Jesus bore in his body all the sin of the world. In his body. When he came off the cross, the world had been set free. Satan had been overcome. Sin of the world was overcome. Evil was overcome. But only now it's put in safe deposit. It's there. As a finished work, it's there. But the sinner must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So what is salvation? Salvation is coming apart of the family of God. The family of God. What is he doing with you and I? He's raising up a family. But we cannot be a family member by joining the church. By taking up the doctrines of the church. By even being good, doing good things. We cannot. Why? Because the seed he didn't have on Palm Sunday, he did have on Easter Sunday morning. He had finally the seed that must pass into every believing human. So when you got saved, a seed was put in you. You were saved by the seed of God. You were brought into God's plan as a pure member of God's household. So when John wrote that whoever has a seed in him cannot sin, he was right because the Christ in me is not a sinner. He doesn't sin. He lives in a body that sins sometimes. He lives in a soul that sins sometimes. And that soul may be making grave sins right up to the resurrection morning. But he who is the life of the believer cannot commit sin. Now, did you ever wonder why a Baptist was so steadfast to say, once saved, always saved? They had part of the Scripture working for them. Because when 
God's seed goes into a believer that cannot be denied, it cannot be stopped, it cannot be killed, it will not go away. It is everlasting life. Whosoever believeth in him, John 3, 16, shall have everlasting life. How? By the seed. You thought you were doing a noble thing when you got saved and so you could be like all the rest of them in the church house. But that's not really what happened. What happened to you was that you became a member of God's household, his royal seed in you that would never be removed and would work on you in a great percentage of your life if you didn't give it its place. When you don't give the seed of God the place he wants in you, he deals with you in strange and unbelievable ways. Take my word for it. Will people make heaven who are not right? I believe so. When they get rid of this body, you won't have any temptation anymore. But the seed will never be taken away from you. That's what gets you through the pearly gates. That what makes you a member of God's family. The seed. Have you ever thought about having the seed in you? Have you just wrestled with life, eternity, and all the problems human being has in this world and said, oh, God, when will you help me? When will you do something? If you were genuinely saved at some point, God put his seed in you. What is that seed? Paul comes along and says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the seed. That's what the Baptist didn't preach, that part. I had Baptist preachers look at me and say, I could never preach that. I'd lose my congregation. I can preach they're going to live forever. They like that. But to tell them that there's a seed there, and that seed is explosive, it's Christ. It caused them to do things and be a part of things they never dreamt of. Why? The seed is God's heart. God's part, Christ's life, and it will always be drawing you to greater things. It has always bothered me at this point that some people who heard this word obviously never did get the connection because they left it. They left it. But if they were genuinely saved at the judgment bar, they're going to give an account for what they did, and God is going to ask pertinent questions about the seed. Well, let's look on a little further here. Every believer, every believer who has accepted Jesus Christ is resident in God's seed, which is Christ. You're resident in that. That's why he didn't save Israel. That's why he didn't turn all of the household of Judaism into his plan. In fact, the, the Jews, to be in his plan, will have to go all the way up near to the millennium before they have anything breaking for them. What is it? that could have us read all these scriptures and not understand them. You're a part of God. He put his seed in you. You're not God's, but you have the seed, Christ living in you. That's what God was waiting on the cross for, because the cross gave him the right to break his rule in everything he had said for 4,000 years. No more law. That died with Christ. All of the things that men thought they could do within themselves to be saved was ended. It stopped there. It stopped when the seed died. 
People are always saying to me, well, when did all this business of Christ in you start? The minute the seed was dead. It had to die. And the minute the seed was dead, God had the justification to open up a whole new world through Jesus Christ. You are a part of this grain of wheat. You are an intricate part of this Christ because you couldn't be saved if he were not God's seed and if God had not placed the same family seed in you. That's what salvation is. That's why salvation is a person. Salvation is not a thing. It's a person. We are saved by his life. It is his death that took away our sin. But when you come to the moment of accepting Jesus as your Savior, that's life. That's eternal life you're dealing with. I want you to look at some more important things here. Jesus, the original seed of God. could not bring forth any new life. Let's take another little incident. Bible scholars have molded over many, many times about the dying thief on the cross next to Jesus. Christ in his love, a kind of love he had never shown before, he could look over at this dying thief and say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Not the Father's house. But he wanted that fellow who was a believer, said he was a believer, to have that. No seed transfer. Why? Christ isn't dead. He isn't dead. I don't know when the... Thieves on the cross died, what hour, what time. But I know that until Jesus dropped the dead head on dead shoulders and cried, it is finished. It is finished. That's it. Now, he could look at anybody and say they believe. Those Roman soldiers, some of them did come to belief. We assume that at least one of them accepted Jesus as his Savior. He didn't know all that was going on. He had no idea what God was doing through that lamb on the cross. But they could have been saved a second after he died. Did death save him? No. Because life was due to come on resurrection morning, Easter Sunday morning, and, and our understanding. It is a wonderful intention that God was going to conform inside of each of us a seed. That seed would make Christianity possible. A few years after that, when Paul and Barnabas had the meetings in Antioch, stayed there for a couple of years, they were the first to ever transfer the understanding of the seed to believers. I hope I'm doing that for you here. We don't have a lot of scripture on being saved from the Apostle Paul. But we have a lot of scriptures on being in Christ and Christ's cross. Why? That's what matters. That's the only thing that really matters. So God's original plan 
was that he would take a part of himself. He gave it first to Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross and gave it to whosoever believeth. Can you understand that? Look at John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many times we quoted that? We said, oh, let's just bring all these sinners in here. If they don't see that at that moment they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God places Christ in them and fulfills his promise that they will have a new creation life. I can give no answer to what happened to them. So every born-again Christian has the seed in them. That seed shall not perish. It's alive forevermore. That's a part of God. That doesn't make you a God, so don't get the wrong belief. That makes you a part of God's family. That makes you a part of heaven. In heaven, it is my simple belief that nobody will be there who is not born again. Not a one. Why? It is the new birth that brings us to the place where we become what God's issue was. What was his issue? That men could not do right by commandment. 4,000 years he had tested that, and human beings could not do what was right as human beings. They needed something else. They didn't need God to perform miracles so that they always had a miracle in front of them. What he needed to do was to give a part of himself. He did that on the cross. He did that when Christ died on the cross. He gave a part of himself to whosoever believeth, they will have everlasting life. You're being conformed to Christ. That's what you need to be conformed to. I run into people all the time who say, well, I'm taking a certain uh, lesson in my church of how to be a Christian. Too late. That's too late. You need to have that in your mind and your thinking. Because when that seed is planted, you're never going to be free of the outreach of Christ to you. He has come into you for him to be on this earth what he was as Jesus of Nazareth. You're here to witness, to preach, to evangelize, to do whatever God created you to do. And that takes us back to creation. When God created each of us, don't you know his creation of a human being would fit the seed of Christ in you. It wasn't a helter-skelter thing. It wasn't something that Jesus came up, special meeting of the angels. That was the plan from the beginning. The plan was that he wanted you to have Christ as your life because he is the only one that ever pleased the Father. When you got saved, that's what happened. He put Christ in you. You were, in one of Paul's statements, baptized into Christ. You were immersed into Christ. God left out nothing. If you had to be completely covered with this new knowledge, that's what he would do. Preachers couldn't do that. Church baptistries couldn't do that. Doctrine couldn't do that. That's something the Holy Spirit would do when you accepted Christ as your Savior. He would take you into these wonderful places that so few of us have ever discovered. I've had the experience during the last 40 years of stepping into new crowds and talking about Christ being their life that scared them to death. 
absolutely scared to death. You know what? They didn't know what the Bible had said at all on this. But they knew where they could find some writings that disannulled all this. Good bookstore has plenty of books to disannul Christ living in you. But God's plan was different. He's going to have a group of people on this earth who carry out the mission that Jesus tried to carry out for Israel. That's what it is. He's put Christ in us, and we are being conformed to that Christ that's in us. And he wants us. Jesus said what we would do. He said, you will do greater works than I have done. Why? They would do everlasting works. Everlasting. We've had the idea that if we get everybody sick, healed, it'd be a new world. That doesn't even come into the picture. I did something the other day when I was on this thought. Something about Paul. Paul has no experience of praying for sick people. Only four times in Paul's writings are miracles mentioned. Four times. Signs and wonders are mentioned. Signs five times and wonders four times. The word healed is mentioned one time. Healer is mentioned three times. And that's all I could find that had to do with God setting man free outwardly. Why didn't Paul preach all that? Why didn't he pray for the sick like Peter and John and others had back before Christ died on the cross? Why didn't he do this? You must listen to me closely now. Why is it God's not healing everybody? I read something the other day written by Oral Roberts that I had in my notes. And you know what he said? He said if seven people get healed in one of my meetings, that's great. I never thought he'd say a thing like that. Out of 15,000 people, you got seven. But that's a fact. That's a fact. Very few people were healed in those ministries like I had. I had a tent. And I prayed for the sick. I didn't know any difference. I had never heard these things I've talked about here today. Didn't know they were in existence and didn't find anybody else that knew it. Let me tell you, here's the secret. Here is the glorious secret of God putting his seed in us. With Christ in you, with the knowledge that Christ is in you, how in this world could you ever be separated from Jesus Christ First thing I tell people when I go in a sick room or a hospital room, I tell them, well, we're going to be all right because the healer's already here. Oh, praise the Lord, they say. They think I brought him in. <laughs> they say, praise the Lord, because they were saved people but didn't know where Jesus was. He lived in them. I was happy to pray for them. I stand with them. I'd help everybody that's in trouble if I can. I can't correct them with all of these things in the scriptures. But I can manifest them as best I can. I've kept the seed of God in me. Isn't that something? Why didn't Paul raise up a group of people to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Why? It's simple. You have Christ in you. You want to share him? You find a sick pe 
person, share him. He's your life. Let Christ in you come out. It's in the seed. That's what God wants. He's put the seed in you. There is no other salvation for you. There is no other way you could possibly be saved because the seed is in you. I don't want you to leave this room despondent. I want you to leave this room with what the scriptures say. what the scriptures say. If Christ lives in you, you are more than outfitted for the things that may come about in this world. I watched the line of people in one place that were being taken one by one and shot, killed, because they were Christians. I don't know what they believe. But I can promise you that God the Father was watching over that. And he's watching over you too. You've got Jesus in you. He's not coming and going. He lives in you. That's why 146 times Paul said we're in Christ. Somebody said, why didn't Paul say that we were all going to get healed and we're going to all be blessed for it. Uh, why didn't Paul say you ought to be born again? When he talked to Jesus, he came up with something further out than that, way out. The thought came to Paul, how in the world should I be in here holding classes for evangelists to heal the sick when God has birthed? his son in every one of them, in them. Well, that'll kill Christianity right now because it's off, off track already. You understand that? Do you understand that these preachers that are raising all this money to carry on their ministry, that they have Christ in them? What does that mean? Nothing. They're trying to keep that hidden. It's a hidden secret that Christ lives in human beings. That's why our message didn't go over so good. I know these things. What am I expected to do with this knowledge? Do what many others who have come to this knowledge did? They quit. They just quit. Rob and I can't quit. As long as we have health, we've got to carry this message. May not be more than 30 or 40 people joined in this room here, but we have hundreds that come to other meetings. We've got to carry this message. We can't stop. God looks to you and I to be faithful. To get this message out. To get it out. That's what this is all about. That's why we gather here. We've got to get the message out. I've spoken from the heart of our Lord today because I've taken scriptures from the different people who come to know who he was. Talking to Peter, we have no evidence that Peter ever found out for sure who he was because he had the seed in him. The seed matters what you preach. 
what you teach, where you go to church, what fills your ears, what goes into your heart. You are responsible to the Christ who lives in you. Are you aware of that? Does it ever bother you? Can you sit with a group of people criticizing Christ and Christianity without saying a word? Stupid people need to have a word said to them because you and I will answer for what we know that we didn't put out. Well, I got notes that go on and on on this subject. And by the way, I have a set of DVDs, or the DVDs on the seed. CDs, CDs. I would urge every one of you here in Dallas to get hold of some of those teachings. I've only scratched the surface. I long for you to join with me in bringing the one message that Jesus had to die for to this world. I'm finished. That's it.